Okay, so hi everyone. I'm Yong Hao Jet. I'm one of the representatives from Taylor's Lakeside Model United Nations, and I'll be moderator for today. In conjunction with Women Mental Health Day, we are having this guest speaker panel to talk about the top to talk about the topic of suicide prevention and also self-harm. We're very honored to have to be able to invite two very prominent speakers from our very our very own Taylor's School of Liberal Arts and also Science, Dr. Anasuya and also Ms. Pang Jai. And also this event is also in collaboration with Taylor's Psych Society. Okay, so good, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, whichever, whatever it is. I am Associate Professor Dr. Anasuya Jagadevi Jagadisan. I am currently the Director of the Center of Human Excellence and Development, as well as the Program Director for the Master of Counseling Program in Taylor's University, or the soon to start Master's in Counseling Program in Taylor's University, depending on when you're watching the video. Hi, my name is Ms. Pang. I'm a Psychology Lecturer at Taylor's University, Bachelor of Psychology. Uh, some of you might see me around because I do teach foundation, I do teach diploma. So the first very first question is, do you think that the lockdown and pandemic are the biggest contributor to the recent rise in cases of suicide and also self-harm? Short answer would be yes. Long answer is a bit more complicated. The short answer is yes, because the lockdown and pandemic created situations where people are stuck at home with potential abusive situations with themselves where they need to have a way of expressing themselves so they don't have a way of expressing themselves with a situation where they don't have money, there's no income and they feel guilty, they cannot support their families. There's fear levels which are going through the roof because they are in panic state. So yeah, I mean, the, the pandemic is the catalyst and it's created a situation, but not everybody is going to be suicidal. Not everybody feels the need to suicide. So for those individuals in that in the pandemic situation who have this extra ordinary circumstances or situations that are unique to them in their lives that, you know, that, that put inside them a need to kill themselves, to end themselves, to stop the pain or whatever, you know, um, whatever terminology that you use. Yeah, that's where you have the complicated story of the catalyst. Uh... I would like to call the pandemic and the lockdown as a catalyst that triggers all these emotions. And on top of that, it is also because um, we, when people try to reach out to other people, sometimes things get worse um, because a lot of times we try to have this positive mindset where, oh, it's okay, it'll pass, you're going to be fine. Uh, sometimes the more you say that, right, it, it actually makes things worse for them. So sometimes when they choose to reach out and you don't say, I don't like to use the word, say the right thing, but when people are unaware what they're doing, sometimes it just makes things worse. So that can also be a trigger. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so a very interesting word caught my eye. So the word catalyst. So is it safe to say that rather, it's also a catalyst, but is it say that it's a lot of underlying problem and then this pandemic is the thing that sparked these kind of cases, right? Yeah, but in this case, it's not sparked. It created a pressure cooker at home. Sorry, I just want to add on, right? Uh, yeah, Our okay. pandemic is still, didn't just happen. Uh, as much as we try to adapt to changes and everything, the first year was easier. But as time goes by, I also noticed within myself and with, with my students, it's, it's eating them up very easily now. I think it's the build up. We try to be strong. We, we try to manage. We try to go through day by day. But at this point in time, I think it already built up and we don't realize it, how much it's fighting us. We just thought we can manage, we can manage, we can get through, we can get through. Everything will be going back to normal. There's no such thing as going back to normal. And I, I don't like the word normal. I'm not a big fan of the word normal because to me, it's still going to be a new environment, a new change, especially with schools opening up and things like that. So there is a lot of different kind of challenges that hits us and the worst thing is hitting us at one spot and we do not know and psychologically, honestly, I think we still need human to human contact. It's not just the build up, it's the exhaustion. We are tired of it. Do you think is that, okay, so is it like the getting the fed up part a bigger impact on like mental health or is it the isolation aspect of the lockdown that has a very big impact? You're asking a, a car has got four wheels, Okay. So the state of the road, the state of the road is the pandemic. Okay. Then now the four wheels of the car is I'm fed up, I got mental health issues, I got this issue, I got that issue. It doesn't matter which wheel goes wrong, the car will stall. 
which is also why you don't get you get people who don't feel suicidal. And one of the worst things that we can have with people who don't cut and the people who don't feel suicidal and don't feel you cut, if you can go and say, look, all of us are in the pandemic. I also don't feel like killing myself. What is wrong with y'all? How can y'all think that the pandemic, I'm also in it, everybody's in it, but why are y'all so special? But that kind of thinking we need to throw out the window. Mm. Okay, so, so that, that, that is the danger of that questioning that you were, that, that form of thinking that you had just now. I hope you can see it. And you know, it's one of those things where it allows for people to make this judgment that I am also in the pandemic. I also have this problem. Quite true. Uh, that is really what is, uh, and that's why sometimes we don't understand why people react so huge. And then we judge them. Chill, man. Da, da, da. Asking that person to chill when they're pissed off, I would say, you know, you're so pissed off, go ahead. So is there a, like a trigger point uh, or a point of no return for someone that is like committing self-harm or someone that is, has suicidal intention? It's, 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 I, I don't know, in psychology world, we always say there's always a spectrum. So self-harm in what sense? Self-harm in what way? And um, a lot of times, sometimes it just happens. Not to say no return, but uh, a lot of times, a lot of times, I'm not going to say all, but a lot of times self-harming, uh, they do not want to end their life. They just do not know how to release that tension within themselves a lot of times. But to me, self-harm is a coping mechanism. It's a form of way that once I, I cut and I see that blood flow out, it, it, the focus, my focus is no longer on the emotional pain that I'm experiencing. I'm focusing on releasing that, that, that pressure within myself. You'll be very surprised, right? In a lot of studies done, right? A lot of times, right? They will know when to stop. Okay, but before that, can we dive yeah. deeper into the concept of self-harm? So you mentioned that it's a coping mm. mechanism, right? So ideally, yeah. it's generally thought that it's not a very good coping, coping mechanism, but do you think it's a viable option if there's no other options for that specific person? Oh, yeah. It's definitely, no, like, like Shai said, I totally agree with that. It's a coping mechanism. The, the only reason why it's not a good coping mechanism because you can accidentally on purpose kill yourself or accidentally on purpose do a bit more harm because like some people when they cut, then they cut in one place too many times until it doesn't heal. So yeah. then they start bleeding out more. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's, it's a very viable option. The reason why people cut, the reason why people slam their fists against walls, which is my choice of self-harm, certain points in our lives because things get overwhelming and you know you feel trapped you feel you don't know what else to do self-harm does help so yeah it does work temporary temporary yeah, life. Temporary. yeah. Okay. let me just share one uh, i work with someone who got raped and our culture always think that rape makes you dirty so what she does for her self-harming is she takes the metal scrub you know the one we wash plates and pots and she used that as her shower because she felt that she's very dirty. And I noticed it wasn't just her. It was a lot of people because our mental state is that if you get raped, you're useless. You're an invaluable in society. You're dirty. That's the word. You're dirty. So their coping mechanism is because they felt so dirty every time when they shower, they will use something harsh. Even when there's cut, right? And it's painful, you know. I have another one similar where... Um... But this was a boy and the parents parents used to call the boy all kinds of words very bad words so in order to clean himself he, for him it wasn't the pain he will cut in the shower he will cut in the shower and it wasn't the pain it was watching his blood go down the drain so you know so for him when he when he sees himself his own blood go down the drain then he can then he can manage going to school talking to his friends pretending the world is okay and actually his parents are crap and you know, stuff has happened. So it, it does help, it really helps. But the reason why they help, that has to be addressed. So when you go deeper and you look at the pain that they're hiding, the pain that they are forced to go through, the situation, the trappedness that they have, you know, the judgment of people that, oh, you know, you are dirty, you are not accepted, there's no place for you. These kind of things, you know, are what people who cut overcome. So if our society can be kinder, can be more accepting, can be, you know, can be softer, then maybe they don't need to cut anymore. So the fault is not in the victim. 
The fault is in a society that supports the perpetrators. So do you think that suicide is a personal liberty? Ah, uh, from the suicide kind of uh, aspect is, of course, our mentality is our body. We will, or people who are self-harming, we tend to, our body, you know, you don't tell a smoker to stop smoking after he had a good meal and then he takes a cigarette, you say, hey, don't smoke, lah, no go for you. You think they don't know. Ah. You, they actually know. Is it a personal choice? Here's my question. If somebody is in a situation where they, are, they feel trapped and they feel they have no choice, can you say their choice is a choice? If, so, if, I have, if you, from your life circumstances and societal circumstances, have put you in a position where you feel you are trapped, you cannot move, there's no hope in my life, I don't know what to do. I, you know, I feel like I, everybody has given up on me. So should everybody else give up on that person? And to me, the answer is no. I don't believe that, I, okay, like, this is a personal belief here. I do not personally believe that suicide is the choice of somebody in a same state of mind. As human beings, we are hardwired for life. We are hardwired to exist. So when somebody chooses to end their existence, it is a form of existential madness. Because at that point in time, all we can do is protect the living. But while that person is still alive, I will fight to keep them alive. Because suicide does not hurt one person. There is, you know, when somebody comes and tells me, or I will, I will, if I kill myself, it will reduce the pain in the world. No, that's a lie. You can say that suicide will reduce your pain, but you cannot say that suicide will reduce the pain in the world. Your freedom ends when other people are hurt. So as when other people are hurt, we have the chance to intervene. Why do we intervene? We don't arrest the person. That's ridiculous. They're not committing a crime. What they're doing is they need intervention, they need support, they need a system that can act as a way to help them and to help them heal and to find their way and to give them hope. And jail does not do any of those things. So yeah, so for me, you know, it's, it's a weird, it's not an easy answer. It's a very complex answer and it does go down to the philosophies of what people believe. I just want to add on to something is that um, for the society, all of us, need to reframe our mind a little bit in the sense of people who seek help, right? A lot of times when people seek for counseling or clinical psychologists or any form of help, uh, our society will feel like, oh, you're broken. You, you will not be 100% functional anymore in society. And uh, so that's why a lot of people are not seeking for professional help. The reason is because they do not want to be labeled. They don't want to be stigmatized that, you know, that, you know, they're not, they, they, they can't find a job. A lot You'd be very surprised when I talk to people, right? They are very scared of going for professional help is because if other people find out they went for professional help, they won't get a job. They won't be able to feed the family. And, and this has to change. Just be kinder. Be kinder. A bit more compassionate. You don't have to go empathy. Empathy is a very big word. You know, it's a short word, but compassion is a bigger word, but somehow empathy seems bigger. No, no, just be compassionate. Be kind. You know, just be kind to people. Just, just be compassionate to people. And, and to yourself. Be kind to yourself also. Oh, yeah, it's in yourself, yeah, in yourself. Be kind to yourself. Self-care. Okay, so I think you can move on to the last question, which is, okay, let's just end on the lighter note. Lah. So any general advice for self-care, self-love? Find what makes you relax. And what makes you relax may be different from other people. And whatever you find, some people like facials, some people like playing with their dogs, some people like going skiing, some people like mountain climbing. Well, uh, get a support group. People reminding you, self-care, everything. Um, yeah, be kind to yourself, really. Um, because honestly, if you crack or you get exhausted or whatever, it, it becomes a ripple effect. People will get worried about you. People could see. You don't have to tell them they can see it. And yeah, be kind to yourself, be kind to others. And yeah. Okay, I think I can end it there. 
So let's just so thank you so much once again, Ms. Pang and also Dr. Anasuya for attending this speaker panel and also sharing such insightful views and hope that society can move to a better, more kinder direction in the future. Lah.